Hello. So today we're going to continue what we didn't finish last time in pro discrete probability distribution. If you remember, last time we played a dice game, and there are two games, game A and game B. In game A, you toss a pair of dice. If the sum is a 7, the player wins $20, otherwise the player loses $1. In game B, you still toss a pair of dice. If the sum is 7 or less, the player wins $5, otherwise the player loses $1. So we played this game 10 times, and as a class, we play 80 times. We also calculated the theoretical expected value, if you remember, following the formula, which is right here. Um, mu equals the sum of x times p of x. So all you need to do is multiply the random variable x, the value, by its probability, add all of them, and that's your expected value. So for game A, uh, our random variable x is the income for playing the game. So there are two outcomes that can happen. If you lose the game, your income will be negative to 1. If you win the game, the income will be $20. We also calculate the probability of these two events using the probability distribution for tossing a pair of dice and record the two numbers that you get, which we did on page 2. <clears throat> Um, so for game A, in order to win the game, you have to get exactly 7. According to this table, it's 6 out of 36. Therefore, we have 6 out of 36 under P of X for the outcome of $20. Since winning and losing, they're complementary. They're the opposite events. The probability of losing will be 1 minus 6 over 36, which is simply 30 over 36. And you could check that they add up to 1. And then we're going to follow the formula to calculate the expected return. x times p of x, so negative 1 times 30 over 36, that's negative 30 over 36. 20 times 6 over 36, we obtain 120 over 36. We add these two as instructed by the formula and obtain 90 over 36. If we convert this fraction to a decimal, it's going to be 2.5. What this number means if a player keeps playing game A for, let's say, infinite number of times, then in the long run, on average, every time the player plays, he or she is going to gain $2.5. So that's basically the expected return for game A. Um, for game B, very similar. Since the winning rule says that if you get a 7 or less, you win $5, we check out the table. 7 or less, that includes the first 6 probabilities. So we simply add them up, the highlighted ones in this page. Then we obtain 21 over 36 for game B. That's the probability of winning $5. Since winning and losing are complementary, we find out the other one has to be 15 over 36. We apply the formula x times p of x. Uh, for losing, it's negative 15 over 36. For winning, it's 105 over 36. Add them up, we also obtain 90 over 36. Um, so, converting to decimals, it's simply 2.5. Therefore, we conclude that these two games, no matter which game you play, you will always get the same expected return. And now, the next part of this game uh, the next part of this handout is actually calculating two more things because if you just compare the expected return We don't see a difference, right? Both of these two games yield $2.5 if you keep playing it. So how do you decide which game is better for you? That means we have to calculate something more We have two more options to calculate Expected mean uh, expected value is the mean which is the measure of center but only describing center is not enough. So we also need to describe the measure of variation. If you remember, we have two measure of variations that are very typical. One is the variance, the other one is the standard deviation. Therefore, we have two more formulas. For variance, this is the formula. If you look at the formula closely, uh, we need to calculate first 
the square of the deviation from each data value to the mean. So x minus mu, and then you have to square this. Once you calculate that, we multiply by p of x, the probability of obtaining that outcome, x. And then we add them up, and that's going to be our variance. So let's use gamma as an example. First one, x minus mu. Our x in this row is negative 1. Minus mu. Mu is the mean that we calculated earlier, which is 2.5. We square this. If you calculate this, it's going to give you 12.25. So that would be this part. And then we do the same thing for the next row. Next row, x is 20 minus mu, which is 2.5. Square it. And if you calculate this, it's going to be a pretty large number, 306.25. And then we have one more step. So we're going to multiply what we just calculated by p of x. So the first one will be 12.25 multiplied by p of x. In this row, it's 30 over 36. It's the probability of losing. If we calculate this, it's going to be 10.21 approximately. The second row, very similar, so we're going to use 306.25 multiplied by the probability, which is 6 over 36. And this one will be simplified to 51 over 0, 04, approximately. And then we simply add these two numbers. If we add these two numbers that we just calculated, we will obtain 61.25. And that is our variance. That is our variance. So I would like you to pause this video and try to compute the variance of game B. Once you finish, you're going to continue the video and see if you did uh, get the answer correctly. Now pause the video. All right, hopefully you calculated the variance with no problem. So for game B, the first one lose uh, x value is negative 1 minus the mu, which is 2.5, and squared. It's the same as before, 12.25. For winning, x value is 5, minus the mu, 2.5. Square it, you get 6.25. And then we multiply those two values by the corresponding probabilities. In the first row, it's 12.25 multiplied by 15 over 36, and if you calculate that, it's going to be approximately 5.10. Second row, 6.25 multiplied by 21 over 36. If you calculate that, it's going to be approximately 3.65. And now we add these two numbers, we should get 8.75 as the variance of game B. So did you get 8.75? Let's put the numbers in this table. For both games, the expected value is 2.5. That's the expected return. Variance for game A, it's 61.25. And for game B, it's 8.75. From observing these two variances, you can already tell that game A has a larger variance, game B has a smaller variance. What that means is game B will have a more consistent result because it has a smaller measure variation. To calculate that deviation, we simply take the square root of your variance. So for game A, we take a square root of 61.25. And if you round that, it's going to be approximately 7.83. For game B, take a square root of 8.75. That would be approximately 2.96. So that's the standard deviation for each game. And again, for game B, we have a smaller standard deviation. So here is the ultimate question, right? We calculate these um, parameters for two games, the expected value or the mean, the variance and the standard deviation. 
Let's revisit question one again. Based on our analysis of each game, if you were the player who wants to earn more money, which game would you prefer to play, game A or game B, and why? To, so to answer this question, I'd like you to pause this video and think about it. Once you are ready to answer, you could start the video again. All right, hopefully you have thought about this. By looking at the numbers, since the measure of center are exactly the same, we're going to look at the measure variation. The measure variation tells us that game B will yield a more consistent results. Since the center is always going to be 2.5, it's probably going to be less risky if we play in game B. And even though the return for game B uh, every time you win is not as much as game A, but in the long run, game A and game B, they have the same expected return. Um, so for people who don't want to take risk, probably game B is a good choice. Uh, but for people who do want to take a risk, maybe game A is a good choice. Also, you could also consider the number of games that you're going to play. If you're going to play for just a short amount of times, like 10 times that we did in class, or maybe 20 times, it might be wise to play game B. Because, you know, game A, the probability of winning is not that big. And also, um, there's a pretty good chance that you might not win anything for game A. While for game B, there's a very high chance that you're going to win. Um, and because it has a less variation, uh, it's more likely that you're going to consistently win $5. So probably game B is a better choice if you only play for a couple rounds. But if you keep playing the game, I'm thinking game A might be a better choice. So number seven is still an open question, but this time you will have uh, these numbers to support your selection. So that's the dice scan that we played. <coughs> The next thing, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to go back to our slides. So if we go back to our slides, we I have a slide that summarizes the calculation of these three things, the expected value or mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. So if you ever have any question, make sure you come back to this slide and look at the steps and follow the table that we did in class. Um, the last section is mixed examples. So there are two more things that you might encounter on your exams or homework. The first question is, what is the range of the usual value? So sometimes these questions could happen. And to answer this question, we usually use the range rule of thumb for a bell-shaped distribution. Uh, the maximum value is two standard deviations above the mean and the minimum usual value two standard deviations below the mean therefore you have these two formulas right here maximum usual value mu plus two sigma minimum usual value mu minus two sigma so this is usually after you calculate the mean uh, the variance the standard deviation from the probability distribution the question might ask you what could be the maximum usual value and what could be the minimum usual value. What we used is very similar to what we talked about about z scores. If you remember back then, we calculate your z score, convert your high to z score, and I told you that if you have a z score that's between negative two and two, your height is not that unusual. But if you have a z score of height that is less than negative two or greater than two, then your height is pretty significant. So it's the same idea right here. Those are the maximum usual value and uh, maximum and minimum usual value. The other question that you might get is, is the given number a significant unusual or extreme value? So this question, we need to think about this question. It's different from outliers. For outliers, we use a different way to measure. But this way, a given number, significant unusual or extreme. So in this case, we'll use probabilities. And there are two ways that you could test out. One way is you measure probability of x or more. See if that is less than 0.05. If it is, then the x value is significantly high. On the other hand, if you calculate probability of x or fewer, and that is less than 0 0.5, 0 0.05, then 
x is a significantly low value. I have some examples right below. Uh, so for example, probability of getting 501 or more heads in 1,000 tosses. According to calculation, it's 0.487, and that is greater than 0.05. So we conclude that getting 501 heads out of 1,000 tosses is not really that significant or significantly high. If I calculate uh, 470 or fewer heads in 1,000 tosses, the probability turns out to be 0 0.031, which is less than 0 0.05. Because this one is less than 0 0.05, we conclude that getting 407 heads in 1,000 tosses is actually something pretty significant, or in this case, significantly low. So it's very unusual to get 470 heads or fewer in 1,000 tosses. That's basically what that means. Now let's look at an example. Consider a question on an SAT test which has five possible answers. Part one, if answers from 1,000 students are analyzed about how many correct responses are expected if we assume the question is so difficult that all students make random guesses. First part, uh, since it's talking about multiple choices, you have to pay attention to how many answer choices are there. In this case, we have five possible answer choices. So imagine these questions are in an alien language that you don't recognize. You can only recognize the letters A, B, C, D, E, and you have to make a guess. So what's the probability that you will guess it correctly? Since we have five answer choices and you don't know any of them, each one of them will have an equal chance of being selected. Therefore, the probability of guessing it correctly will be 1 out of 5, right? So probability of guess correctly in this case will simply be 1 over 5 because only one of them is the correct answer out of 5 possible answers and each of them is equally likely to be selected. And then since we have 1,000 1, students total, the probability of guessing correctly is 1 over 5. To find out the expected number or the expected students who will answer the question correctly, we simply multiply 1,000 by 1 over 5. It's just like if I toss a coin 1,000 times, how many heads do you expect to get? You expect to get 50% of 1,000 tosses because getting heads, the probability is 50%. So you multiply the total number by the probability of getting head. In this case, it's the same thing. 1,000 students, the probability of guessing is 1 over 5. We multiply them and we get 200. So we expect that only 200 students will guess it correctly. That will be the first one. Second one, given that probability of exactly 205 students got it correct is 0 0.0289 and Probability of 205 or more correct answers is 0.358. What can you conclude? So if you remember from the previous page, the only probability that we care about are probability of x or more or probability of x or fewer. In this case, it is 205 or more. So it's the first case. We're looking for if the given number 205 is a significantly high number. But according to our calculation right here, probability of 205 or more is 0.358, which is greater than 0 0.05. So we can conclude that 205 students uh, guessing correctly is not an unusual value or you could say a significantly high number. Also makes sense, right? Uh, 205, it's not very high either. So that would be your conclusion for this problem. And that's pretty, pretty much it for chapter nine. It's not chapter nine, sorry. Uh, section nine, discrete probability distribution. So we finished this part now. Uh, next week, we we'll be talking about binomial distributions and there will be probably two more videos on this um, 
So wait for my announcement. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.